السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Dear viewers everywhere welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda Our phone numbers are back to original beginning with the record 0020238552482492 and the email addresses are ask at huda.tv uh, alternatively gardens at huda.tv uh, um, we have a few questions and meanwhile I'll be more than happy to start collecting your questions and concerns inshallah via the phone numbers and the email addresses uh, before that I would like to assure the viewers alhamdulillah we do our best to answer uh, the loads and loads of questions that we receive either on the Facebook page or the different email addresses but sometimes it is too much because it's only literally one person we don't have like secretaries we don't have the assistants who who can handle uh, this much of load of questions so please uh, forgive us for any shortcoming I'll, I try to do my best Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us to assist and help each other. Allahumma ameen. Uh, the first question is from brother Usama. He says, does giving in a charity cancel sins if a person persists in making sins? Okay. With regards to charity nullifying, remitting and erasing sins, yes, there are many references like that. Especially if the charity is given in private and it is concealed. Uh, in one hadith, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sadaqatu sirri tutfi'u ghadab al-Rabb. Given in a charity uh, secretly, when you conceal your charity, uh, it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it extinguishes and puts out Allah's anger. And Allah would get angry whenever his hurumat, his prohibitions are being violated. So if the person does give in a charity that would assist in remitting and erasing his sins keep in mind the sins will be forgiven if the person seeks forgiveness and if the person ceases and if the person repents but if the person persists on doing the same sin and he does not repent they would not be automatically forgiven by themselves in uh, in the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In tajutanibu kaba iramatun hauna anhu, no kafir ankum sayyatikum, one would hilkum mudhalan karima, surat nisa. If you avoid the major sins, guna kabir, the great sins which there are set punishment for them, whether in the Quran or in the sound sunnah, such as adultery, such as cheating false testimony, drinking, not praying. The minor sins will be forgiven because there are minor sins which the person does not necessarily pay attention to them as he does going in the market and he may have said things which he did not pay attention to. Uh, look, uh, the look which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has forbidden him from looking at the beauty of a woman who is not lawful to him accidentally, things of this uh, nature they will be forgiven automatically. But when the person chooses to do the sin and on a regular basis, he does not want to seize, he does not want to quit, he does not repent, then they will not be forgiven. The Hajj and the Umrah and the five daily prayers do remit the sins. But if the person does not seek forgiveness, does not repent, does not seize from this particular sin, it will not be forgiven. That's why in Surah uh, Al Imran, there are beautiful ayat in this regard. I shall share them with you, inshallah, after these calls. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sister Asia from the KSA. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, Sister Asia. Thank you for asking. Barakallahu feeki. 
uh, actually, this is not a question, just a compliment, uh, Sheikh. Uh, I could not uh, attend. Uh, I could not attend yesterday's Weavers Plus due to some reason. Uh, but uh, uh, I and my family joined the farewell for uh, Brother Malik. We all surely miss him in Hoda TV. It was. It is sad, but it. But it is Allah's will. May, 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 uh, maybe Allah has something better hidden in his departure. May Allah reward him uh, and his family with the best of dunya and akhirah. We will surely remember him as we remember Sheikh Mutasim, Brother Malik, Brother, uh, Brother Musa, Brother Jalil, and all of the Huda team. I often make dua in Mecca for Huda, uh, uh, for Huda team. Thank you, Sister Asia. Barakallahu feeki. Very nice words. May Allah accept. Uh, I would like to reiterate what I mentioned earlier. We consider you guys our bigger family. Uh, you're able to see us, and perhaps you do not see the cast who are behind the cameras, behind the scene, who are doing most of the work. But subhanallah, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, al-arwahu junudun mujannada. Their souls and their spirits recognize each other. So like the like birds fly together. The good people recognize each other even without getting to see each other or visualizing each other or communicating physically with each other. We love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not a secret. The only reason which is keeping me currently in Egypt is Huda TV. Other than that, Allah knows best. Barakallah fikum sister Asia. Thank you so much. The ayah which I wanted to refer to uh, of Surah Al Imran, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged the believers to haste towards doing good deeds, repenting, and being qualified to be amongst Al Muttaqeen. Wasari'u ila maghfiratin min rabbikum, wa jannatin arduha as samawatu al ardu, u'iddat lil muttaqeen. Then uh, in the following segment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with some of the traits of those people who will be eligible for maghfirah and gardens as wide as the heavens and the earth. Maghfirah. And look at the order. Every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about uh, paradise as a word, it is also preceded by maghfirah. In Surah Al-Hadid likewise, sabiqu, sabiqu means race, rush all together. Towards maghfiratin min rabbikum din wa jannatin arduha ka ard al samai wal ard. In Surah Al Imran, sari'u wa sari'u, race, rush, hurry all together towards maghfiratin min rabbikum, forgiveness from your Lord. Because this is the right order. Forgiveness, then you'll be able to enter Al Jannah, which is as wide as the heavens and the earth. Maghfiratin min rabbikum din wa jannatin arduha. السماوات والأرض. In the hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "لم يدخل أحدكم الجنة عمله. None of you shall simply enter paradise because of his good deeds. Because no matter how much good deeds we do, they are not sufficient to give thanks or gratitude for one blessing of the countless bounties of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. The companion said, "يا رسول الله, O Prophet of Allah, even you." Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do tremendous good deeds. He used to stand up in prayer until his feet would swell. And uh, his answer was shocking. He said, even me. Unless if Allah covers me with his mercy. We know the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was infallible. Was the greatest good doer. The most beloved to Allah. The most righteous of all. Yet, he admits that I shall only enter paradise by the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مَنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Who are they? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who spend in a charity, in prosperity as well as in adversity. في السراء والضراء. Number two, Al-Kadhimin al ghayd those who suppress their anger. wal afina and those who pardon people. And Allah loves the good doers. Then, also, amongst their traits, 
والذين إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم ذكروا الله فاستغفروا لذنوبهم ومن يغفر الذنوب إلا الله ولم يصروا على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون Underline the last statement ولم يصروا على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون Your question was with regards to a person persists in making sins Persist يصر الإصرار is persistence and also among the traits of al-muttaqeen who are eligible for Allah's forgiveness then paradise as wide as the heavens and the earth they do what? إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم whenever they commit a فاحشة any illicit act or they wrong themselves by any sinning by any disobedience because they only wrong themselves not anyone else ذكروا الله they remembered Allah they remembered his punishment and they remembered his forgiveness so they rushed to seek his forgiveness. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ So they sought forgiveness for their sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interrupts this statement by saying, وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who besides Allah forgives sins? And the answer for this circle question is definitely no one. وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they do not persist on doing the sins knowingly. I love what Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, said with regards to an innovator. He said, لَيْسَ لِصَاحِبِ بِدَعَةٍ An innovator will not be forgiven. His tawbah will not be accepted. And uh, some people objected to him and said, why not? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah forgives all sins except shirk. He said, yes. But the forgiveness will be granted upon demanding forgiveness, seeking repentance. But Sahib al Bid'ah, the innovator, believes that he's doing cool. He's just fine. And he is practicing his innovation, believing that it's a good thing. So, because he does not recognize his fault, accordingly he does not repent, and accordingly he will not be forgiven. Look at this right understanding. Because the conditions of Tawbah, brother Usama, is. Number one, to recognize your error. Number two, to regret. Number three, to quit. Because if one says, yeah, I know it is haram. It is haram to smoke. It is haram to smoke marijuana. Or it's haram to drink. Okay, what is next? May Allah forgive me. Oh, no, sorry. This forgiveness is not for granted. It is not just me saying, oh, Allah forgive me. Those who accept bribery and rishwa, they read Quran and they open the drawer and they, they, they take the rishwa. They will not be forgiven if they go for Umrah and Hajj because they still do it. When they go for Umrah, when they go for Hajj, when they give in a charity, they try to justify their misdoing. They accept the rishwa and they think they can give rishwa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want your sin to be forgiven even if it was the worst sin other than shirk? Yes. Quit. Quit. Do not persist. What if I quit and I made a strong intention to quit and then a while later I got weaker in Iman and I indulged into the same sin again. That's a different story. But you made an effort and you quit. You did not persist and you're asking Allah to forgive you. Assalamu alaikum. Sister, our brother Aziz from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Askuda. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah feek and thank you for asking. Okay, well, very, very, very good program. We are watching you all the weeks, every, every day. Uh, Sheikh, I have one question. No. Uh, my father is actually alive, you know, he's alive. And he wants to distribute his property. Uh, he has three sons and three daughters, including me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Approximate the pro value of property is about uh, nine, 9 million Indian rupees. Okay. According to my father, he is giving the son ten times what he what the daughter is are getting. So what it should be according to Sharia. Okay. Your father wants to distribute his wealth equally? Sorry? Does your father want to distribute his wealth equally between the sons and so the why daughters? Is not clear, sir. Why is it not so much clear, you know? Naam? Once again, I'll say once again, sir, please. 
Okay, why don't you repeat the last part of your question? How does your father want to distribute his wealth? No, that is not the question. I couldn't uh, hear you very well. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. I, I will answer okay. both ways, inshallah. Thank you, brother Aziz from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Hamid from the KSA. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Salah. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome How to are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Okay, uh, in Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa iza salaka ibadi anni fa inni kareeb. And mm. I think that this is the only ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say kul. Kul, true. And he does not want anybody in between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, the, and his uh, slave. True. Now, back home, I'm from Kashmir, the, the part which is occupied by India. There, most of the people, they are asking uh, help from the dead person, mm. who are to be five, but still ask uh, help from them. I don't know how, why don't they follow this ayah and just ask directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. I just want you to uh, please uh, just shed some light on this one so that they get the, the, the clear message. Bye. Thank you so much and Jazakallah. You're most welcome. Brother Hamid from the KSA. Brother Aziz, his father is still alive. May Allah protect him, give him good health, and maintain his iman. Allahumma ameen. Now he wants to distribute his wealth during his life amongst his children. He has three boys and three daughters. The technical question which we need to ask is, is he going to distribute the wealth in a sense to write the wasiya that once I expire, my wealth, my inheritance should be divided this way, or he wants to give people, give his children, give them properties during his life, would it make any difference? Yeah, it will. Most people, in order to sort out any problems and avoid any conflict, they write their wasiya, the bequest, or their will before their death, and the, the, the great solution is to say, please distribute my wealth according to the Sharia, ah, and that's it. You're off the hook. You're not blameworthy whatsoever. You fulfill your duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or perhaps you can invite a scholar and sit with you and see how much do you have and whether you have other ears, because it's not only the children, but maybe you still have living parents. For you, it will be your grandparents and so on. Maybe he has another wife, not necessarily your father, but I'm talking about in general. So we have to look into these options. Then we decide accordingly the share of each person divided according to the Sharia ah will be will, with regards to the brothers and sisters. The father or the mother upon their death, their wealth will be divided between the boys and the girls according to the ayah of Surah Insa. لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ for the male, double the share of uh, a female. Or the male will get the share of two females. And by the way, this is actually of the legacy of Prophet Muhammad It is not something that uh, as Orientalists blame Islam or pick on the Sharia ah for. Just study the Sharia, ah, learn the inheritance law, and you'll be most amazed. Because in some cases, the male will get double the share of the female in about four cases. And in some other cases, uh, the male and the female will get even shares. And over 30 cases, perhaps, the female may get bigger than the male's share. And sometimes the female will inherit and the male will get no share. Perhaps you can present a couple of episodes about the inheritance law and you'll be very surprised. Most Muslims do not know these facts. They only look at this ayah. Look when the father have a bunch of kids, boys and girls, sons and daughters. The daughters whom he prepared them for marriage and spent uh, whatever, and now they're already married, and their husbands are fully in a charge for their support financially. While the son is in a charge of supporting another girl who may inherit from her father half of the share of her brother. So because the man is in a charge to support, for supporting the family financially, not only that supporting his wife, his children, his mother, if he has a living mother, and if his sister happened to be in need also, it will be his duty to support her financially. All of that from the share which he collected from 
his father. This law is a divine law. So we have to go by that. But during the life, if the father wants to give gifts to his children, there are different opinions, whether it must go by the inheritance law or according to the hadith of Al-Nu'man ibn Bashir, if I have time after these calls, inshallah, I will discuss it. Brother Abdul Rauf from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, how are you doing this evening? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, barakallah feek and good evening to you. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Uh, I just want to know because uh, when we start making uh, wudu, uh, we have to say bismillah every time we start making our wudu. Yeah. But what is the ruling when we go to the washroom where there is water closet uh, closed by, in a where there is door closed and there is water closed. Do we have to still recite Bismillah before uh, starting the wudu or it's only where there is only ablution faucet area where, uh, where mm -hmm. we can say Abdul Bismillah? Abdul say it within yourself without uttering the words, without moving your lips. Like now I'm quiet, but I meant to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim myself because it is an emphatic sunnah and some imams actually consider it wajib because of relying on a hadith that says if one does not say the basmala in the beginning of the wudu, the wudu will be invalid or nullified. But the more right view that it is valid even without it, but you'll be missing a great deal of an emphatic sunnah. To come out of this uh, uh, problem, there are two ways to do it. Like if you, before you enter the bathroom or if you cover the commode and say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, or you say it in yourself and perform your wudu. Barakallah uh, feek. An-Nu'man ibn Bashir, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that his father went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to seek his testimony, to ask him to witness, to a'atiyya, a gift that he decided to give to his son, An-Nu'man ibn Bashir. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa subhanallah, He's teaching us how to judge between people, how to answer questions, not to take things out of context, not to listen to only one party or one side of the story, but to be very comprehensive be before passing a judgment. Don't let anyone to fool you, because a lot of people when they ask, they tend to put the answer on your tongue. They make the question like, okay, that it has only one answer. So in fact, the Nabi Wasallam began by asking him, do you have other children other than a Nu'man? He said, yes. He said, did you give each and every one a property similar to what you gave to a Nu'man? He said, no. He then, اذهب. أشهد على هذا غيري فإني لا أشهد على زور. I do not bear witness to falsehood. Find somebody else. Which was an indication that this giving was invalid and it was haram. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered that we should be just in distributing gifts amongst our children during our life. With regards to whether this covers both genders in the life or not, there is a difference of opinion in this regard. But for sure, if you're dividing your inheritance within your life as a will, that you're not transferring the ownership and the position to your children, yeah, and you just write in your wasiya, in case I die, that this house will be to my son and this flat will be to my daughter, it must be according to the ayah, لِلْذَكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Ummu Ahmed from Kuwait. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Ask Wada. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah reward you all for your effort and the patience. Amen. Sheikh, I want to shed a light on my issue. Me and my husband have invested some money with the people selling gas in bulk. They were giving us a profit on a monthly basis as they were selling the gas at different um, price. Uh, the profit varied according to the gas price. Mm. Uh, this Suddenly they stopped giving us the profit and they held our capital. And this was not only done with our investment, but all other investors mm -hmm. who were part of the mm -hmm. investment. Therefore, hmm, the four of the investors put a lien on the property owned by the company man. He had a dead gas station. Okay. Our lien was on the gas station, and we were able to get the gas station as a security that our money will not be doomed. As uh, we are not staying in Canada, 
and were advised by our, by our friend on the procedure, how the press, process of lien and transfer deeds are conducted. All paperwork was completed and me and my husband went to Canada to complete the transfer to us. For that, we registered a local company there so that they, it can be officially registered under our name and two other partners mm -hmm. at the time of closing. We were informed that gas station has a loan of $700,000. Mm. We had a difficult decision to make. Therefore, in order to save our hard-earned money, we ended up with this loan. The loan was from mortgage broker, and we have ended up paying over 5000 per month that we are paying for last few months. So, and you said the collection sum of your capital sum, you ended up actually paying more in addition yes. to your loss. Yes, our, the person through which we invested, actually, I think he betrayed uh, us a little bit or uh, did not uh, tell us the exact position. Meanwhile, the other two partners betrayed us and have stopped paying their share to the mortgage and running expenses. Hmm. Since my husband's salary is tied to the contract, it is possible that if we stop making the payment, the monthly income will also be garnished. Hmm. Since the gas station is dead and we will have to start it, run it for a few months and then sell it to recover the money, the present value of the gas station is not enough to pay the loan leave aside our money. Hmm. <clears throat> Mortgage is haram and all our life we have a with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have avoided any form of interest and <clears throat> we don't want to buy an apartment or house on mortgage that's why we invested this money in the in this section alhamdulillah but now at the age of retirement we find ourselves in this precarious position mm. Our intention from the Prophet made was to help our family and widows, and my husband has been having terrible nightmares since he has started making these payments. May I ask you one question, Sister Umm yes. Ahmed? Yes, uh, please. Is it a dry gas station? Yes. A dry gas station? Yes. You know what dry is? It, it, it's a dead, actually. It's not in a working, it's not no, running. running. I'm sorry. Yes. Let, me, let me explain what I mean. When, okay. when the gas station is remodeled and would function eventually, are you going okay. or whoever will, will operate it would also sell liquor, beer, and, and uh, uh, you know, pepperoni and, and smoking, uh, cigarettes, tobacco, and lot of tickets? This is only gas station with the workshop uh, in it. Correct. The workshop sells all of what I mentioned earlier. Would that be actually available in the gas station? Do you know? Uh, yes, I know, but it's no, there isn't any convenience store or nothing like this. So it's only gas? Yes, only gas and car repair. Okay, okay. So we both believe in test for us, uh, and Allah, inshallah, will guide us out of it. Our question is, should we continue to pay the mortgage until the gas station is in running condition and can fetch us enough money to pay the loan and retrieve, retrieve our investment? How long or would that take? The, How long would that take? Uh, maybe the three to four months more. Mm. And the broker or whoever is running this business for you uh, assured you that in two, three months you will be able to uh, recall your money back or your losses? Sure, because uh, actually we have to invest more. Our partner betrayed us. They are not contributing with us uh, for the running expenses and for the mortgage. My husband is on paying all the expenses from his salary. Or uh, otherwise, if we stop paying, our salary will be garnished to the lender and uh, we lose all our invest capital investment and plus the case will be, might be the uh, mm -hmm. case against us. Thank Sister so, Muhammad, thank you so much. Yeah. I comprehended your whole masala now. Unfortunately, I will not be able to give you a direct answer right now. I would really uh, uh, take some time to think about it 
and consult other superiors because this is a very uh, tricky question. It's not because you're trying to trick me or anything, but it's, it's a tough situation, uh, you know, for losing your entire life saving, reaching and approaching the retirement uh, age, and also trying to live, alhamdulillah, wa shukla, halal life since the beginning. So inshallah, uh, hopefully, uh, inshallah, azzajal, next episode, you will find the answer to this. And I will share with the viewers this whole mas'ala, if any of the viewers didn't get it, this is a very serious one. And it's a serious test. But I, I actually say by the end, Alhamdulillah, in a test, in money, in health, in life even, as long as it is away from being tested in your deen, is insignificant. Money comes and goes. Health can be recovered by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only the deen, if the person is tested in his deen, that's it. That is the ultimate loss. Uh, I will pray for you and inshallah Azza Jal will get back to you with the answer to this question. Sister Ummu Asya from the KSA, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum Sheikh. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. I thank you for waiting for so long. Uh, my question is about missed salah, like the Qaza salah that we have missed out in the previous years of our life. Mm -hmm. How do we make it up for it? I mean, okay. how do we compensate for sure. it? Any other questions? Um, no, Thank you, Sister Masiya. We'll take a short break, and inshallah, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, I think we have some callers. Assalamu alaikum. Please try again. Uh, we, we have Brother Hamid's question from the KSA. Uh, Brother Hamid asked about uh, one of the most beautiful ayat and uh, revealing such a great glad tiding of Surah Al-Baqarah in the course of fasting right in the middle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this ayah, ayah number 186. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Which means, and whenever my servants ask you, O oh, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, about me, uh, with regards to how far, how near I am to them. فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ And you're so right. That is the only mas'ala in the Qur'an which the answer is delivered without saying فَقُلْ or قُلْ The word قُلْ means tell them or say. So even that command verb which say was eliminated in order to indicate how near, how close is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in, in the verbal term. Right away he said, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Did not say, قُلْ فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Indeed, most surely, I am near. How near? In Surah Qaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And we are closer to him than his own jugular veins. Furthermore, Allah is closer to you than your own heart and mind. So accordingly, أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ Whenever a caller calls on me, I shall answer his call. Don't you remember that whenever we pray, we say, Sami'a Allahu liman hamida, because he is a Sami'a al-Basir. Accordingly, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Let them respond to me. Al-istijaba will be by invoking Allah, calling upon him. مَنْ لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ One who does not ask from Allah, Allah will be angry with him. The ultimate form of worship is to ask from Allah, is to invoke Allah, is to supplicate to Allah. And that's why a dua should be only, only directed to Allah and not to anyone else. Not even to his most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Not to any of the angels. How often we spoke about Ibrahim alayhi being thrown in fire, being cast with a carabot falling in fire 
Allah subhanallah, I can imagine this situation. Then Jibreel alayhi salam, the boss of the angel, with 600 wings, this stands upon him. Ya Ibrahim, alaka haja, how can I help you? Oh, excuse me, you don't know what I need? But he didn't ask for him. He said, Amma minka fala. A need from you? No. My need is with him. And he said, Hasbi Allah, huwa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for me and he is the best disposer of all affairs. Why do people ask from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is simply like, why do people disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They know it. Staykanatha anfusuhum. They were certain that Allah is a Samir and Al Basir. He is the only one who answers the dua and He is the only one who hears. What, but the yet, they, their actions prove otherwise. Why? They chose so. So our role is to convey the message. The pure message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Take for innocence this beautiful ayat uh, in Surah Al-Hajj. يَدْعُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُ وَمَا لَا يَنْفَعُهُ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الضَّلَالُ الْبَعِيدُ They call other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُ وَمَا لَا يَنْفَعُهُ Who will neither harm him nor benefit him. Why? Because... No one does but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How far is that plain error? Then in the following ayah, يَدْعُوا لَمَنْ ضَرُّهُ أَقْرَبُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِ لَبِئْسَ الْمَوْلَى وَلَبِئْسَ الْعَشِيرِ In brief, invoking other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an act of shirk, plain shirk. One word. So, any person who says, I take them as means of approach and so on, I will refer him or her to the beginning of Surah Az-Zumar. They said, ما نعبدهم إلا ليقربونا إلى الله زلفة. It's like history is repeating itself. The same argument between the pagans in Mecca and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, don't you believe that Allah is the creator? He said, yes, we do. So why don't you invoke him alone? We're not worshiping these guys, these idols. But we're only taking them as means of approach. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Samira from United Arab Emirates. Wa alaikum wa salam, Shaykh. Masha Allah, subhanallah, Shaykh. What a beautiful answer for this uh, question. I was just listening to you over the phone, alhamdulillah. Uh, Shaykh, I have two questions, please. My first question is regarding Allah's forgiveness. Uh, I heard this, um, actually, I read this very lengthy hadith. About uh, about the Sahiba approaching the Prophet Muhammad that she committed adultery. Sister Samira, she... Sister Samira, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Trust me, I can't hear anything. I can barely understand a word of what you said. It's it's something with the phone line. So if you can raise your voice a little bit and slow down, and start over with your question, I will appreciate that. I have two questions, Sheikh. I, uh, oh, can you hear me properly? It's okay now? No, unfortunately, I cannot understand. I cannot hear you. Uh, maybe the, the brothers in the control can hear you better, and they will be more than happy to deliver your question to me. I apologize. Sister Rabia from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have four questions. Naam. Uh, if I go to a relative's place, should I perform kasar or pray full? Okay. Uh, my second question is, in my hometown, people say that when in sujood, women should not keep her hands as far as the men do. Is it correct? Uh, third question, while performing sajda sahab, uh, can you explain how to perform it before, uh, before salam? And my fourth question, if we don't know the direction of Qibla, can we pray in any direction? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, sister. Uh, Rabia from United Arab Emirates. With regards to traveling your, to your hometown, uh, it doesn't matter where you're living at completely. If you, for instance, in United Arab Emirates and you're visiting your home country, it depends how long are you staying. Because now you moved, your new location has become uh, United Arab Emirates. So if you go to visit your parents and your family, if you stay less than four days, then you still pray Qasr. 
if you stay four days here and you move to another city for another four days, you still pay cost. But if you decide to stay for more than that, more than four days, from day one, you should pay regular. Whether this is visiting your hometown or going uh, on a tour to another country, even if it is not your home uh, country. With regards to raising the hands, not as far as the man and uh, the positions of uh, the prayer positions for a woman versus the man, I mentioned and I confirmed in the program of the Prophet's prayer, the hay'ah, the way of the prayer for a woman is like the man exactly, no difference. Yes, I know that, and I studied in the Hanafi Madhab, we do certain things like the woman would lower, would put her hands on top of her chest, while the man would put it beneath the navel. In fact, man and woman, they should put both hands on top of the chest, according to the many, many, numerous sound hadith in this regard. And the position of the sujood and the position of ruku'ah, some people say that it should not be like 90 degree or a right angle for a woman, there is no reference to that whatsoever. The prayer of a woman is identical like the prayer of a man. The only thing that a woman should not be praying in front of uh, men, especially who are not uh, mahram. This is number one. Um, in fact, there is a hadith in which Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me praying. Uh, the companions have seen the Prophet ﷺ praying. They transmitted that to their wives, to their daughters, to their sisters, and they have copied the Prophet ﷺ, and this is all described. Sheikh al-Albani, may Allah be on him, has a beautiful message called Sifatu Salat al-Nabi. And actually, my program it was revolving mainly around this message. There is no difference, no specification of a different style for the prayer of a woman than the man whatsoever. As far as your third question with regards to uh, making sujood al-sahu before the taslim, you finish the tashahud, then you say Allahu Akbar for the first sajda. Then uh, you make sujood and you rise up with takbir. Then again you rise, uh, you, say, uh, you make sujood with takbir and you rise up with takbir, then you make taslim and you don't recite tashahud for the second time according to the more right view. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Brother Munir from Libya, and this is going to be our last call. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Munir. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, I have one question. No. Uh, my question is that, is it right for, is it right for Muslim to, uh, to share house with nine Muslim? To share what? To share house with nine Muslim. To share house. To, to share we house. are all tenants, but those people, they are, they are not a Muslim. Is it right to share house with them? Okay. Uh, can you explain furthermore what is the reason behind it? Munir, can you hear me? Uh, hello. Okay, can you explain furthermore wh what is the reason behind it? Why do you have to do that? Okay, obviously you cannot hear me, no problem. Inshallah, I will answer you. Uh, we have Sister Moasia from the KSA with regards to making up the missed prayers for years. Uh, the vast majority are of the view that you can make up your prayer of the missed uh, years, if you have been missing years of the prayer, for instance, you pray with each prayer, another prayer or two or three prayers until you assume that you made them up. Of course, that would not really make up for it, but this is just to make up the missed prayers in addition to your repentance. There is a school, such as the school of Imam Ahmad and Sheikh al-Islam in the Tamiyyah and others are of the view that if you messed up the prayers for years and deliberately, then you have entered into the state of disbelief and exited the boundaries of Islam, out of the falls of Islam. And once you started praying again, this is like you have entered Islam from the beginning and you've made the shahada and you started a new Islam. So the area before or the era before Islam, while you were in a state of kufr, doesn't count. And they advise instead the person should increase offering nawafil, like the prayers before and after each father prayer, duha, witr and the Hajjud night prayer, 
prayers between uh, Maghrib and Isha, these are all nawafil, super irrigatory prayers, whether emphatic or non-emphatic. So whichever opinion you choose will be fine, insha'Allah, Azza Jal. Barakallah feekum. Uh, Brother Munir asked about uh, sharing a house with non-Muslims. If there is a reason, like students who have to stay in the dorm with non-Muslims, it is not their choice, okay, but you have to have a plan and we have to set the rules. Like for instance, Muslims recognize what the term aura means. Non-Muslims, they do not care the least. Uh, a man before a man would take off their clothes. You know, we have seen miserable scenes in the gym, in the Y, and here and there. They go to the shower and they sleep in the nude. It's like, you know, we're all men and the girls the same. That's not permissible whatsoever under any circumstances. Cover up your aura except for your, uh, your wife or your husband, for your spouse. This is one thing. Uh, what we have to listen to or watch or do, يعني we set the rules from the beginning. And I take this as a mission. My mission is to deliver the message to this person and give him what is known as Hidayatul Irshad, the guidance of showing him the path. But Hidayatul Tawfiq is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of our teachers who have studied in some European countries and shared rooms with non-Muslims, they return home messed up. They return home atheist, agnostic. And instead of giving them da'wah, they were very much affected with their disbelief. Why? Because they become so much liberal. There are no haram and halal whatsoever. What they like, they do, and this is halal. What they don't like, they consider it haram, even if Allah made it halal. So it is based on the benefit-risk ratio. I was actually exposed to this position almost maybe 15, 20 years ago. Somebody offered me, and instead of living by yourself and encountering all this course, why don't you share a house, and be, become like a housemate with the family? Uh, I like the idea initially where I can sit and talk to people and improve my language, etc. But once I walked in, I could see, not necessarily foresee, I could see the fitna which I was going to be exposed to. And our shiuch taught us this beautiful message which I would love to share with you. As-salamatu la ya'adiluha shay. What does it mean? I'm not going to say today because we ran out of time. Until next time, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech, keeping my heart your remembrance and in your deen.